Good evening, everyone. Tonight Hi, is... First lady. Huh? Hi, first lady. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Tonight is Wednesday, June the 10th, 2020. It is great to be alive and well. God has been good to me and my family. He's been good to my church family. For that, I'm so grateful. I will not bore you with any long dissertations tonight, I don't think. I only want to talk about the Word of God and what, is, what He is relaying to us through the book of Isaiah. We have 17 more books left to explore after our study of chapters 48 and 49 tonight. I don't, quite, I don't know quite how it got started, but with United Fellowship started reading the Bible from Genesis to Revelation quite a few years back. We didn't feel like jumping from one section to another, taking things out of context without knowing what the Lord's trying to relate to us, and his message is clear and to the point. We wanted to just settle down and grab as much of it as we could. We have completed the Bible only once thus far. And we find ourselves here tonight in Isaiah during our second reading. We limited our readings to one and two chapters per Wednesday night, especially if they were long chapters. Our goal was and is to get more clarity and understanding from God's holy word. I offer my thanks to those of you who have committed yourselves to sticking this out with me. I do hope that we will be able to finish our second reading all the way to Revelations. May the sweet Holy Spirit of our Lord and Savior rest and abide with us as we delve into his holy word tonight. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost for being with us through these last 12 weeks. I have never seen anything like this in my life, but I know who holds my future and your future and I know who holds our hands. Praise the wonderful name of Jesus. There were famous accounts of Babylon in the Bible, and it included a story of the Tower of Babel. According to the Old Testament story, humans tried to build a tower to reach the heavens. When God saw this, he destroyed the tower and scattered mankind across the earth, making them speak many languages so they could no longer understand each other. There was now a bridge between the language that the people spoke. Different dialects, phonics, etymologies prevented people from fully and comprehensively understanding each other's language. The Tower of Babel was the city of Babylon, which appeared in both Hebrew and Christian scriptures. And the Christian scriptures portrayed Babylon as a wicked city. Hebrew scriptures tell the story of Babylon, Babylonian exile, portraying Nebuchadnezzar as a captor. Neo-Babylonian empire, and the word neo means new and different. A new line of kings established the Neo-Babylonian empire, which lasted from 626 BC to 539. A new line of kings established the Neo-Babylonian empire, which and, and it became the most powerful state in the world after defeating the Assyrians at Nineveh in 612 BC. Isaiah, as you know, occurred in the year 700 when he was the prophet during that time, which was almost 100 years before all of this took place. Okay? The Neo-Babylonian Empire was a period of cultural renaissance in the Near East. The Babylonians built many beautiful and lavish buildings and preserved statues and artworks from the earlier Babylonian Empire during the king reign of King Nebuchadnezzar. That empire was shortly lived. And in 539 BC, less than a century after its founding, the legendary Persian king Cyrus the Great conquered Babylon. I talked about that a couple of weeks ago. The fall of Babylon was complete when the empire came under Persian control. 
After Babylonian conquest of the kingdom of Judah in the 6th century, Nebuchadnezzar II took thousands of Jews from the city of Jerusalem and held them captive in Babylon for more than half a century. Many Judeans returned to Jerusalem after the Neo-Babylonian Empire fell to Cyrus the Great, the Great's Persian forces. Some stayed and a Jewish community flourished more than 2,000 years. Many relocated to the newly created Jewish state of Israel in 1950. What I want to talk about tonight, the, the, the one word that I want to talk about is, what is a bridge? The kids' definition, I think, gives us a good definition of it. It's a structure built over something as water, a low place, or a railroad so people can cross it. The place on a ship where the ship is steered. The third one I think is very important to us tonight. Something that joins or connects. Something like, the, like a bridge of the nose bridge between cultures. I think that is the biggest bridge that we have to cross in today's society. There are so many cultures. There's so many different uh, ways of thinking. And unless there is a bridge built to create a connection which would join us together, then there is no way that we would be able to cross that bridge. In uh, the adult definition, it says to make a bridge over or across bridging a river, bridge the divisions between two groups Bridge the generation to join by a bridge. There are plenty of rivers and streams running throughout our society today. And we do need to try to form a bridge in order to cross that bridge. Maybe your bridge doesn't look like my bridge or my bridge doesn't look like yours. But what we really want to do is find a way to put one together that will connect us and that we will be able to function together as one. I thank the Lord for that thought tonight. But in the book of Isaiah, as I was studying that tonight, I looked over the, the synopsis of the whole entire book, all 66 chapters, and God designed a bridge for all of us to see. In that book, we see the unfaithfulness of God's creation. In that book, we see judgment and destruction in chapters 1 through 35. With the other chapters broken down, we see the following. We see the, the God of Judah in chapters 1 through 12, which we've gone through. That was God's first call for Isaiah to preach judgment unto the people. Chapters 13 through 27, God asked Isaiah to preach to the nations to let them know that he had an ought against them. Chapter 28 through 35, God spoke through Isaiah to tell him or to tell us of his plans toward us and also toward the nations that were evil as to what he would do uh, in the future. Then there is another bridge, which is 36 through 39. And in that one, we have two crises. We have Assyria and Babylon. The question to answer here is, in God we trust? Or in some other realm do we trust? We have so many people who do not trust in God, who don't know God who really uh, use him as an excuse when they get in trouble, they want some help. But there is a major crisis in society today. And the two cri crises that I would talk about would be good and evil. There is a good force that's working. There is an evil force that's working. You cannot bridge, uh, build a bridge between evil and good. What you have to do with that is leave it to God. In God, we trust. Do we or don't we? 
That is the greatest question that humanity will have to answer today. Later in Isaiah, we see salvation and restoration in chapter 40. We went through that. This is a second call to salvation. He, God so eloquently placed these different situations in life in, these, in this book. It it's, it's covers the gamut of the whole Bible. So here he's giving us an opportunity. We see salvation and we see an opportunity for restoration. That is the second call for Isaiah to preach salvation. Chapters 40 through 51, that is where Isaiah talks of God's comfort toward us. In chapters 42, 49, 50, and 52, God talks about the suffering servant. Chapters 51 through 55, God's redemption. And 56 through 66, God's renewal. In the 65th and 66th verse, there's special emphasis on the end of this world and the beginning of the new Jerusalem. That's so important for us. I see we are all around. There's so much confusion. That's Babylon. That's Babylon. Just think of the Tower of Babylon. Everybody's speaking a different language and nobody understands each other. God, I pray that you somehow help us to bridge that gap so that someday we will understand what communication, servanthood, and things like that mean to each other. Assyria, the northern kingdom, became the center of the great empires. It was located in what is now northern Iraq and southern Turkey. According to one in, in, interpretation of passages in the biblical book of Genesis, Asia was founded by a man named Asia, the son of Shem. I told you all of this a couple of weeks ago. The Assyrian Empire is considered the greatest of the Mesopotamian empires due to an, its expanse and the development of the bureaucracy and military strategies which allowed it to grow and flourish. So what's happening now happened in the past. There is nothing new under the sun. Babylon is the most famous city from ancient Mesopotamia, whose ruins lie in modern-day Iraq, 59 miles southwest of Baghdad. And I'm sure you've heard of those, those countries. The name is thought to derive from Bavil, which is in the Akkadian language of the time meant gate of God, gates of the gods, and Babylon coming from Greek. The city of Babylon appears in both Hebrew and Christian scriptures. Christian scriptures portray Babylon as a wicked city. Hebrew scriptures tell the story of the Babylon exile, portraying Nebuchadnezzar as the captor, and the famous accounts of Babylon include the story of the Tower of Babel, which I spoke with you about earlier. We're going to go into our chapters now, and I just wanted to give you a brief overview as to what they mean Verse 1, we're going to talk about Israel meaning governed by God. They call themselves after God, but do not live by him. God knew they would be stiff-necked and hard-headed, but because of his mercy, he did not cut them off. Verse 10, affliction would be their refining process. Do you think we're in a period of affliction now? where we are running or going through a refining process. Sometimes I feel that way. In verses 16 through 18, there is speaking in regard to Jesus Christ. 21 through 22, if they had obeyed his commands, then they would have had peace. Do we need peace now? Yes, we do. And it is my prayer that God will give us peace. But somehow or other, Babylon always sneaks in and causes confusion. We need to pray Babylon out of our society. Isaiah 48. Hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel. 
and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth nor in righteousness. So what is God saying to, to us through, through Isaiah tonight? He's saying, there's something I need you to hear. You're called by the name of Israel. You, you say you're a Christian. You say that you're walking straight. And you come forth and you tell us where you came from, out of the waters of Judah. And, and you swore by the name of the Lord. And you, and you make mention of God of Israel. We only mention God when it's convenient for us, you know. Some of us, not all of us. But we're not talking in truth or in righteousness. We use God sometimes as a pedestal. But we're not legitimately living in the righteousness in the way that he wants us to live. Verse 2, for they call themselves of the holy city and stay themselves upon the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name. Verse three, I have declared the former things from the beginning and they went forth out of my mouth and I showed them, I did them suddenly and they came to pass. Verse four, because I knew that thou art obstinate and thy neck is an iron sinew, and thy brow as brass. I have even from the beginning declared it unto thee. Before it came to pass, I showed it thee, lest thou shouldest say, Mine idol hath done them, and my graven image, and my molten image hath commanded them. In other words, God is saying, I, I tried to make it plain to you that it is, it is I who, uh, who are, who's doing all of these things. And I tried to do it from the beginning, so before you would come and give somebody else credit for it. But it's, it's not work. it doesn't seem to be working. Verse 6, thou hast heard, see all this and will not declare it? I have showed thee new things from this time even hidden things, and thou didst not know them. They are created now, and not from the beginning, even before the day when thou heardest them not, lest thou shouldest say, Behold, I knew them. God created us before we were ever in this world. Verse 8, Yea, thou heardest not. Yea, thou knewest not. Yea, from that time that thine ear was not open. For I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously and was called a transgressor from the womb. Verse 9, For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. Uh, saints, we're living in a time where it's easy. It's easy for God to cut us off. He's saying, I promised you that I was going to bring you through these rivers. I promised you that I would be with you, that no hurt, harm, or danger would come upon you. He said, and for, for a while, verse 9, I will, will I defer mine anger. And for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. He, he's saying, I want to discipline you so bad, and I want to cut you off. But because I promised you that I would not do that, that's the reason you're here today. We do have uh, people who don't want to hear. We have people that he said, you heard us not, you knew not. And from that time, your ear was not open. He said, I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously. In other words, he knows the intent of our hearts. He knows we were born in iniquity. He knows we have the capacity to deal treacherously with people. Verse 10 says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. So how is God refining us? 
He's allowing affliction. He's allowing confusion. He's allowing us to go through the refinery. He's allowing trials and tribulations to come upon us. And sometimes we don't understand that we need to take heed to God. I love the Lord tonight. I love him with all my heart. And I'm so glad that he hasn't turned his back on me yet. Though I act in ways sometimes that I deserve for him to turn his back on me, he said for his name's sake, he would not do that. Verse 11, for mine own sake, even for my own sake, will I do it? For how should my name be polluted and I will not give my glory unto another? We have a tendency, saints, to give glory to things that we should not be giving glory to. Everything that happens in this world comes from God. Let's not pollute his name. Let's remember him. 12, he says, hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called. I am he, I am the first, I also am the last. 13, my hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. D do you get this um, magnitude of that verse? His hand laid the foundation of the earth. His right hand spanned the heavens. I remember that poem. I can't remember the guy that did it, but... He said he flung the stars in the sky. And he says, when I call unto them, they stand together. They obey him. Everything in the heavens obey him. You've heard me say that many times. When the sun's time to come up to rise, you don't hear the sun murmuring and say, I'm going to stay in. The sun shines even when the clouds are out. All the clouds do is just drift over under the sun and block the light from the sun. But if you get in an airplane and, and fly above the clouds, the sun is still shining. The, the sun is standing on post all the time. Just where God put him. He doesn't murmur. He doesn't complain. He shines. The moon does the same. The stars do the same. And all of God's earth does the same. When he calls unto them, they stand up together. When the winds blow and he wants them to come down, they come down. 14, all ye, that, that includes you, me, everyone, assemble yourselves and hear which among them hath declared these things. The Lord hath loved him. He will do his pleasure on Babylon, and his arms shall be on the Chaldeans. In other words, I'm going, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make sure that you are protected. But you need to get yourself together so you can hear me. And, and make sure that you don't give anything else or anybody credit for what I'm doing. 15, I, even I have spoken. Yea, I have called him, I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. 16, come ye near unto me. Hear ye this, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, there I am. And now the Lord God, and his spirit hath sent me. Thus saith the Lord, this is Isaiah talking to us, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord, thy God, which teacheth thee to profit, which leadeth thee by the way that thou shouldest go. Oh, that thou hast hearkened unto my commandments. Then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. 
I think sometimes when we don't hearken to his commandments, we may not have as much peace as we would like. And we may not be as right as we should be. Verse 19. Thy seed also had been as the sand, and the offspring of thy bowels like the gravel thereof. His name should not have been cut off, nor destroyed from before me. Go, for, go ye forth of Bab Babylon, flee ye from the Chaldeans. With a voice of singing declare ye, tell this, utter it even to the end of the earth. Say ye, the Lord hath redeemed his servant Jacob. And they thirstest not when he led them through the deserts. He caused the waters to flow out of the rock for them. He claved the rock also, and the waters gushed out. Finally, there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. This is so today. He will cause waters to flow out of a rock for us. And those waters will gush out. We are thirsty. We may be in a desert, but look for the waters, those refreshing waters. Chapter 49, verse 1 tells us the description of Jesus Christ. Verse 5 and verse 1 goes like this. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. He was born in a manger. He was born just like you and me. From the bowels of our mothers. And we need to let him know that we esteem him higher than we esteem ourselves. He needs to be lifted higher. We need to hear more of his word and we need to hear his name more. God is love and God wants his people to unite. We shouldn't say harsh things to one another. We shouldn't be, a, a, I want to say, a, a roadblock or a stumbling stone to them. And sometimes we find ourselves doing that. But in spite of it all, the Lord's name is to be praised and we need to give glory to where it's due. The purpose of Jesus was to bring back Israel to God. And he hath made, this is Jesus, and he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand hath he hid me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord, and my work with my God. Verse 5, this is his purpose now. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Verse 6, still talking about Jesus. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Now, now listen to what this says. You are rejecting me, Israel, but I'm going to give my light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. 
So it seems like, dear Gentiles, we have a job to do. We know that God's chosen people are the Israelites, but he has given us for a moment in time the ability to shed his light on this universe. Let's make good use of that. The gospel in verse 7, thus saith the Lord, here's our purpose, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to him whom man despiseth, to him whom the nation abhorreth, to a servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, because of the Lord that is faithful, and the Holy One of Israel, and he shall choose thee. So here's what he's saying. Redeemer of Israel is Holy One. He is giving the Gentiles the light to shed his light, to show the kings and to show the princes and to show the people of the world who he is. And that is a good thing. And it's our job to cause the gospel to permeate throughout the nations. And you've heard that all over this world. It's being done today. Verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee, and give thee for a covenant of the people, to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. Verse 9, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth. To them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in all high places. I don't know about you, but verse 9 is very powerful and very relevant for today. Read that again. Verse 10. They shall not hunger for thirst, neither shall the heat nor the sun smite them. For he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by the springs of water shall he guide them. And I will make all my mountains away, and my highways shall be exalted. I think we talked about the highways. You remember that? Just make sure you're on the right highway. That's the most important thing. Behold, verse 12. These shall come from, from far. And lo, these from the north and from the west. And these from the land of Sinem. What he's saying is, I'm going to bring my people together again. Verse 13. I want you, when you get together, I want you to sing, O heavens, and be joyful. O earth, and break forth into singing. O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people, and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But Zion said, and here's sometimes what we're saying, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. But here's the answer to that. Verse 15, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. So I don't care what is being done in this day's society, in this world. I know it's hard. I know we have to go through some things. But I tell you people, we need to know that God loves us just like a mother loves her child. God will stay with us. He will not forsake us in any shape or fashion. We need to obey him, stick close to him, follow him, and be what he wants us to be. He has a plan. He has a plan. But we can't get so busy that we can't hear him talking to us. Verse 16 Behold, here's how much he loves us. I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. 
Thy walls are continually before me. No matter what your problem is, no matter what your situation is, if you're just hearkening unto me, I want you to know you're in the palm of my hands. Your walls, your petitions, your prayers, they are continually before me. Number 17, thy children shall make haste, thy destroyers, and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee. 18, lift up thine eyes round about, O oh God, and behold, all these gather themselves together and come to thee. As I live, saith the Lord, thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all, as with an ornament, and bind them on thee as a bride doth. I heard about the prayer meetings in the street. Keep on lifting up Jesus. Verse 19. For the waste and thy desolate places and the land of thy destruction shall even now be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants. And they that swallow thee up shall be far away. These are profound verses in today's society. Verse 20. It says they will come into a land and prosper so that it will be too small for them. The children which thou shalt have after thou hast lost the other huh, shall say again in thine ears, this place is too straight for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. Verse 21. Then thou shalt say in thine heart, Who hath begotten me these? Seeing I have lost my children, and am, and am desolate, a captive, and removed to and fro, and who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These were had they been. And it says here, they will come into a land and prosper so that it will be too small for them. Verse 22, the kings of the earth shall pay homage year by year. Thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will lift up my hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people. And they shall bring thy sons in their arms and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. <laughs> If one, let me go to 23. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. And thou shalt know that I am the Lord for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? Verse 25. It says if one fights against Israel, he fights against the Lord. But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him that contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. And I will feed them that oppress them with their own flesh. And they shall be drunken with their own blood, as with sweet wine. And all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior, and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. I thank the Lord for this. I don't know how long I've been tonight, but I thank the Lord for this blessing. I ask you for your prayers.
And we need to bow our head in a word of prayer, if you will. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. Lord, we thank you so much that you have given a ray of light to the Gentiles. And we are to go and spread your word, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will help us to unify ourselves. Lord, I pray that you will help us to be kind to one another. We're saved by the same blood. We're sanctified by the same blood. And, oh, Father, we know that you are here for us. You don't want to see us divided. You want to see us united in your name. We need to bring glory to you, Lord, not anyone else. We don't need to put anybody else on a pedestal, but we need to put you on that pedestal. You are our creator, and I appreciate you for bringing me into this world, as I am so sure that many of those that are listening tonight are appreciative to, to you also. Help us, Lord, learn to love one another. Help us to be kind to one another. And God, whatever we do, help us not to offend you. I want to be a soldier in your army, Lord. I want to be pure. I want to be holy. And I want to be the best that I can be. And Lord, I pray that you will help all of us as we go through this coronavirus and the, the racism and all of the things that are out there, Lord Jesus, the politics. God, none of that equals what we should be doing for you. I rebuke it, Lord, all confusion that's out there in this world, Lord. I pray that you help us to settle down, that you help us to communicate with one another as human beings, Lord, and not as animals. Oh, God, help us, Lord. Pour your spirit out upon your children. Bless us, Lord. Give us the wisdom and the knowledge that we need, Lord, that we can spread your love abroad and take up the mantle, dear Lord. I can't fight your journey, Lord. You can fight your journey. I place everything in your, your hands. Lord, you said it was written in the palm of your hands. I give it back to you right now, Lord Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, for the revelation that you've given me tonight, Lord. You are with us, all of God's people. Listen, he is with us. Do not let sin separate us from one another. We love one another, and we want to keep the love going. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you all very much. Good night. I hope you have a wonderful night.